Hello. Hello again. Um, right, so we're going to start presenting in a minute. Um, what we uh, what we going to have here tonight is uh, Beyond the Browser, Progressive Web Apps, Web VR, and Web Bluetooth, presented by Paul or Sean Chauncey. Sorry, I, sometimes I don't quite present. He, uh, say his name correctly but uh, anyway uh, he's from Samsung Internet uh, he's been uh, working uh, hard on those interesting technologies uh, lately and uh, um, we're very happy to have him here uh, at Just Eat uh, so I have a couple of other things uh, to say to you uh, before we actually start um, so, in case of emergency, uh, there is the uh, the door on your left over there, which is a fire exit, and there is one behind the lifts from where you came in. And this is where you'd actually find the toilets. If you're looking for toilets, they're down at the bottom. Go around the lifts, and that's where you find them. Uh, I don't think we'll have to do that, but uh, just in case. There is pizza. There is a drinks fridge over there. Please help yourself. And to you, Peter, Peter Shaughnessy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Saki. Uh, so, yeah, hi, everyone. It's, uh, it's good to be here and to speak to you today. I'll just turn the volume down on my laptop. I think that's coming through. Uh, yeah, so today I wanted to talk a bit about how the web is evolving and how I think browsers are now becoming much more than just actual browsers. And there's a special focus on, uh, well, progressive web apps and a couple of the other new browser features that uh, I'm particularly excited about and uh, hopefully will be interesting. And it is, of course, January, and it's the start of a new year. And I think that's a good time to reflect and to have a little think about uh, where we've come from and where we're going next. Another good time for that reflection is anniversaries. And this month of January is the 10 year anniversary since the iPhone launched. And even as a Samsung employee now, I think uh, I can agree that that was uh, uh, quite a big moment in, in mobile. And we've all seen since then this happen. Uh, over the last decade, especially, mobile has ramped up and gone through the roof and it's overtaken desktop as the number one internet device category worldwide. And I'm sure in all your own lives you've seen the effect that that is starting to have. So on the desktop, now for quite a while, the web has been the, the default way of, of giving people content and applications. Um, as shown here, of course, by the obligatory XKCD cartoon. Um, and so we're used to the web being something that we can easily use to deliver good cross-platform applications. But unfortunately, on the mobile side, it's been a bit of a murkier story. And of course, I'm sure you all remember headlines like these about uh, HTML5 um, being ditched or dumped by various companies um, and people going with native apps instead. And it's true that the native app world has provided functionality that the web hasn't been able to up to now. And some of those features are, are still not possible in the web at the moment. For example, uh, access to people's contact books for better or worse. And we've also seen some pretty bad statistics for the mobile web. The vast majority of the increase in time that people are spending on mobile phones is going to mobile apps and not the mobile browser. And some reports suggest 80 to 90% of the time people spend on mobiles is in apps versus the browser. And it is just though the case as well though that it's not just native apps, it's just a very few native apps that most of this time is going on. 
most, or actually just about half of US smartphone users in a survey download zero new apps per month. And another study found that mobile users spend 80% of their time in just five apps. And if you compare the actual audience sizes to the mobile web, this actually tells a very different story. It's almost the opposite way around. When you look at the top 1,000 mobile apps versus the, versus the top 1,000 mobile websites or web properties, uh, then you can see it's something almost like about double the audience size that you can get from the mobile web. So the web still has this amazing power of reach. It has the ability for people to just pick up a link and visit you straight away and to have that reduced friction of just being able to instantly access your content. So wouldn't it be really good if we could combine the two and have the best of both? If we could have the web, the things about the web that we know and love, and the fact that it is cross-platform, the fact that it's frictionless, and that it's easily discoverable, any, any search engine indexable, and that it's open for users and also for us as developers. Uh, we don't need to download any SDKs or pay any fees. Uh, you can just fire up a text editor and go. And if we could combine that with the best of apps, for example, being able to add these to your home screen for easier launch, to have real offline usage, and to be able to load applications instantly from cache. Also push notifications to help uh, engage users and bring them back and to integrate with all the various different parts of the hardware on the device. So thankfully people have been thinking about this and they've come up with a solution which is progressive web apps. And uh, this is not actually the official logo, uh, you might be surprised to learn. Um, this is a logo that I made uh, in tribute to Bruce Lawson, who did uh, a similar one you may remember for service workers uh, a little while ago. Um, but yes, Progressive Web Apps uh, is this idea that um, we're really adding, these, uh, adding the best of the native world, best, best of apps to the web that we love. And you may have seen that over the years, it has maybe taken a little while uh, and perhaps longer than some of us would have liked, but the web is catching up with these features that previously were in the native world only. Uh, this was uh, a talk from Paul Kinlan at the Chrome Dev Summit last year, and uh, he, he shared this table of how uh, some of the features have been going from this red, no, no, it's not available in the web, to yes, now we're getting uh, to actually having that in the web platform. Um, things like access to camera, things like offline access, which were kinder before because that was with app cache, um, which uh, wasn't very good. Um, and things like push notifications and some other things that I'm going to share in a bit too. And another thing I wanted to share about progressive web apps is that uh, I guess most of you probably heard uh, of this term from Google and maybe from, from some other, other browsers as well. This is a truly interoperable movement. This was at the Progressive Web App Dev Summit in Amsterdam last year, uh, where a couple of my colleagues, my boss Dan and our colleague Junkie, uh, were on, on stage and on the panel to share that Samsung also uh, uh, really behind this movement and contributing to it as well, as well as Mozilla, Microsoft, Opera. And if you'd like to check out some progressive web apps, uh, a good site to go to if you haven't been to it already is pwa.rocks, which has uh, a bunch of uh, selected uh, web apps. You can submit your own with a pull request if you'd like to see it up there, like we've had, got a couple of ours on there. Another one just on here that I thought I'd highlight is a, just a, one example is Flipkart. Flipkart are, uh, I think, the leading e-commerce site in India, and they launched a progressive web app called Flipkart Lite 
uh, which actually they found tripled the on time, the on site time that people spent uh, with their app. And I, I think it also led to about a 70% increase in conversions. So these, adding these simple uh, additional features and enhancements like offline usage, like push notifications, can have actual real good business value as well. Another good showcase of progressive web apps is outweb.io. Um, this is another one that I've seen crop up uh, recently and there are new examples and demos being added to that all the time as well. And if you start to take a look around on the web, you might find that some of the sites that you use all the time are starting to add some of these features now. This is, for example, the Twitter mobile website, um, which you can see is using a service worker now. Um, and uh, it looks as though they're using that for offline caching. It's also really good to see examples of progressive web apps helping people and, and doing good. And so I like this example from Inspire Hub, um, who, when they had a natural disaster uh, at, back at home, they pushed out an urgent notice feature to um, help people find out and uh, have access to the emergency services alerts about what was happening. And because they used a progressive web app and uh, web push notifications, they were able to get this new feature out very quickly. They didn't have to wait for any app store release processes or anything like that. And they were able to help people in their community. So that's a little bit of the background of progressive web apps, why we've got them, and I think why they can be pretty good. Um, so now I was hoping to dive into some of the specific parts of progressive web apps and some of these particular mobile features and share a bit more about them in detail. So first of all, service workers, because that is probably the fundamental API or the most fundamental API of progressive web apps. Uh, because this is what now actually lets us do offline apps properly on the web and a lot more as well. Uh, actually, and I just wanted to say, yeah, service workers, how I like to think about it now is that they, they're taking us beyond the browser tab. Uh, now your applications can live on um, in the background even when the user closes your, your tab potentially and they can be sat there listening for events that we'll see later on. You can use them for things like push notifications and more too. But firstly, they're just very useful for offline caching. Uh, so here is a little demo that I made just to share with any of you who haven't seen the kind of service worker process of being offline. Also, this is sharing Samsung Internet, our browser as well. Uh, you might have just seen I added it to home screen from a little plus icon at the top in the URL bar there. And it added that icon to my home screen. Then I've gone offline with flight mode and tapped it and it still loads up fine from the cache. And then uh, this is a kind of app for super selfies. So uh, <laughs> the idea is you, you can take a photo or you can actually stream your camera live with uh, get user media as well. And you can uh, doodle on top of it and write things. Um, and then you can add emojis and uh, then you can forward that onto people or tweet it or whatever. Uh, and yeah, it all worked offline. So, you know, if you need to uh, do a selfie like that when you're on a plane, for example, you don't have internet access, now you can. And if you look at the browsers that are behind this, uh, this is the Is Service Worker Ready website. You can see there's lots of green there, green meaning yes, these are the browsers that are behind it uh, and working on it at least. Um, so we've got the usual browsers that you might expect. That purple one in the middle, if you don't recognize it, that is our browser, Samsung Internet, which is the one that gets shipped on Samsung Galaxy phones and tablets. Um, the one that you might spot there that is still yellow is Safari. 
And so that usually leads to the very first question, what about Safari? Um, and I only realized when I selected a Safari slide to go, a Safari image to go in the background that this works very well because it's like the elephant in the room, but the elephants on Safari, anyway. Um, so the thing about Safari is that I think too many people are probably waiting on Safari saying, well, progressive web apps, that's good, but Safari aren't doing, are they? So, you know, um, but actually we can really use these technologies now, there's many browsers behind it, and we can solve Safari by just doing what we always do with the web, which is progressive enhancement. So we can look to see if service workers are available, and if they are, then that's great, we can use them and we can go ahead. And if they're not, then our website, our web app can just carry on working as it was before. The flip side of this, which I think is also an interesting way of thinking about it, is if you do have service workers available, then you can think about offline first. And maybe you can then think about the network itself as being an enhancement. So you can get your app to work just as well offline. And then if you have the network connection, then you can do additional things, then you can update it, then you can sync things. And if you go to, in Chrome, if you use Chrome, service worker internals, this is a nice little way to see what sites that you've been using actually have installed a service worker in your browser. So I tried this yesterday. I had 49 service workers installed from various sites that I've been to. Um, so I encourage you all to try it out as well and see what your number is. You know, maybe you've beaten me, I don't know. Um, and so you might find that actually many more sites than you realize are already starting to, to introduce support for service workers. So actually at this point I should probably ask, who has developed a service worker or written a service worker, added a service worker to any website or web app? Okay, just a few of you. Great, that means I can share this with all of you. Uh, so, this is just a basic introduction to adding a service worker. First, actually not included in the code here, but first what you would do is check if navigator.serviceworker. And if you don't have that, it means it's not supported and you can carry on as normal. If you do have it, then you can register your service worker. The service worker is in a separate script. You will generally put it on the top level of your site or the top level of wherever you want to uh, have that service worker take control of because it, it uh, affects the scope. And once that register promise completes, then you have had your service worker registered. Otherwise, there may be some error and uh, you can handle that or uh, just log it out. And then you have some events that you can listen to and do things on inside your service worker script. So this is in my serviceworker.js. And the first one you probably use is install. So when the install event happens, uh, this is when you have registered the service worker, it's installed, but it may not actually be activated yet, or it won't be activated yet. Um, and you may have to wait until other service workers that you had uh, around from before have uh, been uh, well, sorry, you may have to wait until clients that are using old workers, as in like an, uh, an old tab, for example, are closed down before your new service working can kick in and activate. There are a couple of caveats to that because you can also say event.wait until and you can postpone that installation event until something has happened that you could, might, uh, you might want to wait until you have pre-cached some resources. Um, also, you can say skip waiting and you can say, I don't want to wait for the other service workers. Uh, I know what I'm doing and uh, I'm ready for this one to take over. Then you have an activate event. And this is when your new service worker, this one is actually active. And this is a good time to then clear out any old caches that might be to do with your old service workers. Uh, and you can do that based on the name and you can just version it. And uh, this helps you clear out all ones and make sure your caches are up to date. 
And you can also listen out for fetch events. And this is where you can now have real interesting, powerful control because you can be, you can effectively have a programmable, pro, programmable network proxy for your browser. So you can intercept a, a fetch event from your browser out to, uh, out to your site um, or from your app to any, any site that it's calling out. And you can say, actually, I want to return this from the cache if I've got it straight away. Or you could do a fetch yourself and see if you get a network failure come back. And then you could say, okay, now I'm going to uh, fall back to using the cache if I've got a cache. So there are many things that you can do. But a few little tips from what I've learned as I've been playing with this myself. One thing is not to pre-cache too much on the installation of your service worker. I made the mistake on this uh, super selfie app, Snapbot, of trying to cache hundreds of emoji images uh, because uh, I originally had those all as SVGs in there. And actually I switched out afterwards for them just being the actual emoji characters. But anyway, um, so I had hundreds of emoji images in there and I found that actually it was noticeable that the initial load of the app was slower as it was trying to cache all of these, these resources. So the advice is to just pre-cache on install the minimum amount that you need for your app to initially load and work, uh, the app shell as, as you might call it, and then uh, additional resources that you're then fetching, you can then uh, cache on fetch instead. Another thing that I found useful is Chrome, uh, sorry, the Google developers have created an extension, a Chrome extension called Lighthouse. Uh, has anyone used Lighthouse yet? Cool, a couple of you. Uh, it's just a very handy tool for firstly verifying that your PWA is, is working as you expect with some of these basic features such as that it does actually respond with a 200 status code when it's offline, when you're offline. And uh, in just using this tool, actually it helped me identify a bug at some point where I'd introduced a problem so that my service worker wasn't actually responding with a response from the cache properly. And uh, actually just running Lighthouse, it flagged it up as an error. And I wouldn't have seen that necessarily myself until I'd gone offline and been retesting it again. Uh, and also it gives you data on how, uh, how your app is performing, which is useful too. Another thing I fell foul of, and in fact, I haven't updated this yet in, in this Snapbot app, but uh, what I was doing, which I thought was a good idea, I thought, well, I'll do the network request first, and then I'll fall back to the cache because that way I'm getting the up-to-date data if I can, and if I can't, then I'll serve it up from the cache, um, which is okay, but I was waiting for the fetch event to fail. And the issue that you may have here is that you, if you don't introduce a timeout as well, then you may be waiting a long time because browsers have a different default uh, time when they, they give up on these network requests and then say, hey, we failed. And depending on people's network connections, you might be on Li-Fi, uh, you might find that uh, this comes back after a long time. And so your app may still feel very sluggish even though you've got this cache fallback. So what I am going to do myself and probably what I'd advise if you wanted to look at doing this in a better way um, is to either use SW Toolbox or see how they've, they've implemented it. SW Toolbox is, a, like it sounds, it's also from Google. They've developed this set of tools to make service workers easier, to make specifically around caching rules. So if you import the script, in your service worker, then you can do things like this, saying uh, when someone is requesting a resource under images, then I want to use a network first cache. So uh, try the network and then fall back to the cache. But here you can see they've actually given a, an option for you to add time, timeout as well. So in this case, we can say timeout of 10 seconds and then, then you can use the cache. 
and they've got the other caching strategies that you would think of as well. So you can do cache first, and if you don't have it in the cache, then you can fall back to the network. And also fastest, which just sets them both off in a race and serves whichever comes back first, which might sound strange because you'd think that the cache would always be first, right? That would always be fastest. But uh, apparently, I haven't tested this and seen it myself, but apparently you may actually potentially see the network come back fastest if uh, due to HTTP caching. And I guess depending on how big your cache is, for example. And you can also do network only, caching only. So that's a pretty useful tool. Yeah, those were the things that I was just hoping to share on service workers uh, themselves. They do allow now, though, for other things. And you can do things like push notifications, which can take you beyond the regular kind of engagement that you can get with a, a normal web application. This uh, is uh, now bringing up politics briefly, but I won't say anything about it except that uh, I was interested to see that The Guardian were experimenting with web push notifications during the US election in November. And this was me testing out the Samsung internet and it works in Chrome as well. And so once you say, yes, you can send me push notifications, then you can get alerts just for this specific event that you're looking at. And it's interesting to consider how the web can be quite useful for these kind of ephemeral things. Uh, I tried it also recently with the uh, live tennis scores and updates. And I didn't necessarily need to download an app and say, hey, give me all of your push notifications for whatever you want to send me. You can just fire up a web page or you're already on a web page about something that's happening live and you can just tap a button and you can start getting updates about that for the length of that event, whatever it's happening. This is uh, just another example. This is my colleague Ada, who has developed a podcast progressive web app. And she's using push notifications to tell you when you have a podcast that have been updated and you've got a new podcast to listen to. And uh, yeah, it's so poddle.audio if you uh, fancy trying out sometime. And I haven't really gone into using push notifications myself properly, um, except just from some quick testing out. But one little tip that I did come across, which I thought it was worth sharing, is that in the Chrome debugging tools, you have this little push link there under the application tab. And this emulates a push event. So it means that you can just tap push and you can have a breakpoint in your service worker where you're listening out for the push event and uh, pressing that simulate button will uh, mean that you get one of those push notifications come through and, and you, can, uh, you can use this for testing. But please do use push notifications for, for good and for things that are useful for users. And the advice that uh, Chrome share as well is to please be timely, relevant, and precise. Uh, unlike this one that I had just the other day from my Photoshop Express app, which just said, we miss you, come back. Uh, and so, of course, then I just went straight into the settings and said, block all notifications from that app. Um, so, yes, if you do annoy users, then they will block further push notifications. So make sure it's useful. So now, we've been going through a few bits and pieces today, haven't we? But the next bit that I wanted to share was about actually going beyond the digital world now, because we're starting to have technologies introduced into the browser that are allowing us to interact with the real world around us. And a couple of those technologies that tie well together are physical web and web Bluetooth. Uh, who's familiar with physical web? few people, not too many. Okay, cool. Uh, so basically, this was an initiative originally from Google, and it's uh, open source and there's others involved too. Essentially, it's uh, beacons, but broadcasting a standard 
broadcasting in a standard way, broadcasting URLs, essentially, short URLs. And these can be picked up by any physical web detecting app or browser, and they can display to you what's nearby to you in your location. And this can be useful for things like, well, the classic example, I guess, is the, you go to the bus stop, uh, why should you have to type in a, a, a mobile number to text to get the bus updates, as you see on some of the signs? How about actually you arrive at the bus stop and you see a push notification, sorry, you see a little uh, notification if you want to see what's around you, already there saying, hey, uh, bus time table here, and you can tap that and it knows your location and you could instantly get the, le the latest news about which buses are coming when they're coming next. And this is just an example where I've got a little beacon and an estimate, and I just have this always broadcasting my website because, hey, it's you go to events and why not? Um, and you can imagine this being useful for live events and for pre uh, conferences as well. So you go to a conference and you could have a beacon that's broadcasting the URL to your conference timetable. Uh, that one was Google's physical web app, uh, which, so they have nearby and they also have physical web, which is slightly confusing, but I think physical web is actually built into the Chrome browser. And other browsers are working on this too. So this is Mozilla's Project Magnet, which is, uh, I think for now, a native app, but um, I think they, might, they may well be working on bringing this into the browser itself too. And we have our own version as well called Close By, uh, and it's a, a similar thing on, on the Samsung Internet browser. And if you want to try it out, you don't necessarily have to, all those these little beacons are pretty cheap. Um, you can also simulate a beacon by downloading an app. For example, there's this one on Android called Beacon Toy. And uh, you can download that, and then you can just configure the URL for your beacon to uh, be broadcasting and you can try it out that way. And then you can see things like this. So when I uh, walk past or walk near to my little beacon, I can get, uh, if I choose to have it switched on in the browser, I can have a little alert coming up here to say it's found nearby content. So that's broadcasting these beacons, but then the next bit that fits in really well with it is Web Bluetooth, because Web Bluetooth now, which is uh, another new standard that's being developed, actually enables you to then connect with those Bluetooth devices and interact with them and exchange data with them. So this is just an example of uh, the code to initiate that. You have this new object available, navigator.bluetooth, and you can say request device, and you can say, I'm looking to connect with Bluetooth devices that fulfill this kind of criteria. So that might be that they're advertising a particular kind of service, for example, or it could even be based on the name of the device. And once you do that and you request to pair with uh, a Bluetooth device that fulfills that criteria, the, the browser will bring up this prompt and it will be scanning for Bluetooth devices around you. And if it finds any that fulfill that, then it will list it there and you can say, you can tap it and say, yeah, I want to pair with that one. If you do, of course. And once they have tapped that and chosen a particular Bluetooth device, then from there you can connect to it. Um, you connect to basically it's Bluetooth server on this Bluetooth peripheral, as you call it. Um, which is called a GAT server. And a GAT server, uh, really only what you need to know to get started with it is that it's made up of services and characteristics. So services can describe a kind of higher level functionality, like this one is a battery service. And inside that service, you can have characteristics which are essentially attributes or kind of data buckets uh, that you can read from or write to. So in this case, we're saying, give us the battery service. You can see this is all promise-based, or you can do async await with the new syntax. And then you can say, okay, now from that service, I want the battery level characteristic. And once you've got that characteristic, you can read its value, 
and that will be a bunch of hex bytes because Bluetooth communications in hex and you can uh, get the first of those hex bytes out which is a UN8 and uh, read that out and that gives you the battery level from this particular Bluetooth device. But I wanted to do a demo that was a bit more exciting than reading the battery. So uh, I made this a little while ago, which is a web Bluetooth drone controller. Uh, so it connects to a Parrot mini drone called a Travis. And uh, once it's connected, you can make it take off. This is once we just moved into home, so you can see it's a bit messy around. <laughs> um, and you can control it with the, uh, with the touchpad on your web app. And you can also make it flip, which is the fun bit. And then hopefully land safely again. And I have demoed that live before, but uh, you know, it's always a little bit nerve wracking. Uh, I didn't bring it with me today, I'm afraid, but uh, that's how it works. And actually, just uh, for doing this presentation, I did another little web Bluetooth demo, which is uh, a web app that controls my slides. Um, so this is how I've been tapping left and right uh, with a progressive web app here. And the neat thing about this is because, so I've seen people have done this a lot before with a mobile app, a mobile web app. Um, but normally they have it connected to the network and it's via web sockets that it's controlling the slides. Um, but with Bluetooth, it means that you don't need to worry about the conference Wi-Fi. As long as this has a Bluetooth connection with your laptop, then you can use it to control the slides. So um, in case you're interested, I might make this a little library to make it a bit easier later, but it's using Bleno, which is a node uh, Bluetooth peripheral library, uh, which is open source and easy to use. And so that makes my Mac a Bluetooth peripheral. And then uh, this is just a web app uh, using the, the metadata to make it full screen and, uh, oops, accidentally tapped a notification. And, uh, and then I've got a service, web behind, service worker behind that so it can uh, fire up offline. Um, I've got home screen icon. And then that's all that is. It uses web Bluetooth and then you can pair it up to your Mac and go. Another little thing which I've been interested to try out, I've just been starting to use this. Anyone else got one of these? Yeah, PuckJS. Um, so this was a recent Kickstarter project and it's really neat because it's a little programmable Bluetooth peripheral. You can program it with JavaScript and it's very friendly for web Bluetooth. Uh, even, well, it comes with uh, a web IDE that you can use to program it, um, which I could probably show you briefly how it looks. Um, and so you can just write some JavaScript code in here and say things like uh, LED write and say whether you want it on or off. It's a little bit small this, isn't it? I'm not sure how to make it bigger, sorry. Uh, but I won't actually show this right now because I've got my phone connected to this on Bluetooth and I'd have to disconnect that and connect this. But essentially you just uh, click the connect button, connect it up via web Bluetooth to your PuckJS and then you can start sending it code here from the web ID. Just press that button and it will run on this device. This is pretty neat. Uh, I think maybe next time I might make it so that it changes slides every time I press the button on, the, on here. But we'll see. So that was about the browser going beyond the digital world and branching out into the physical world around us. The next stage, I think, or another thing that's really interesting and I think exciting about the browser is now going beyond reality uh, and into virtual reality. So this is using a new API, which is still relatively experimental, but, but there's, again, there's uh, many browsers behind it. It has been actually around for quite a while now, 
that uh, is being worked on. It's an API that lets you detect any virtual reality headsets that your device is connected to and interact with that to get back, uh, for example, your position data and where you're looking and, uh, and to project onto it your scene that you want to display in virtual reality. So basically it's about making the web browser a virtual reality platform. And here's one example that I particularly like because I guess if you've seen much about virtual reality, you've probably heard of Tilt Brush, which is a, an HTC Vive app. Uh, Mozilla basically recreated this as a web app using WebVR. So this is an HTC Vive web app that has interaction with the actual Vive controllers and you can use it to paint something in three dimensions inside your virtual scene. And the cool or an extra cool thing about this actually being a web app is that then sharing your, your digital creations that you've created in virtual reality with other people is actually just as easy as sharing a URL with them. Um, so that is a painter and it was developed using a library from Mozilla called A-Frame. Anyone used A-Frame? Yeah, okay. Um, so WebVR you can use directly and uh, I didn't actually have time or probably have time today to share the actual raw API, but if you're interested in in playing with WebVR and getting started very quickly, then I really recommend A-Frame because it makes it really easy to develop WebVR apps. You just include A-Frame, the A-Frame script, and then you're actually writing HTML to describe your scene. So this is using custom elements. And if any of you have used 3GS before, yeah, one, two. Uh, you might find that this is kind of familiar looking because it's actually based on top of 3GS. So you have a scene that just, that's basically the, uh, the descriptor of your entire scene. And inside that you can put these 3D objects, like a, in this case, a sphere, a box, a cylinder, a plane, and a sky. And you can describe those just by, uh, just through HTML attributes to say, you know, uh, my sphere should be at this position and it should have this radius and it should have this color. And you can, of course, still control that with JavaScript. You can update any of these attributes and properties with JavaScript however you like. You could use this, uh, you could use React on top of this or, or Angular or something if you wanted to have a, web, a JavaScript framework on top of it. But A-Frame is listening to this DOM and it's updating the actual 3D scene in the canvas behind the scenes. And this is actually that little bit of code that I showed on the last slide when it's actually running. And of course, you're not actually seeing it in virtual reality here. And also it's quite slow and jerky because of the streaming onto the screen. But um, this, just by adding those few tags, you actually have a scene that you can navigate around. Um, and there's a little goggles icon there that if I had a, uh, an actual virtual reality headset attached, or if I was running it on a phone and I wanted to pop it in a Google Cardboard and try it out, I could press that button and it would uh, launch into the stereoscopic view. So WebVR browser's interest um, is pretty good. There's us again, of course, Edge are behind it and they've shared that they are actively working on it and Mozilla and Chrome as well. And I just also wanted to share this. My colleague Ada uh, last week was at London Web Performance and she had about 100 people all trying out a shared virtual reality scene that she built with A-Frame and WebRTC. And she was streaming the positions of everyone and where people were looking uh, out from people's devices to a server and then the server was streaming that out to everyone else so everyone was in a shared environment and uh, each seeing avatars of each other, which is very cool. Um, and there's a blog post about it there if you wanna see a bit more about it afterwards. 
so I've been talking quite a lot, haven't I? But I'm getting on to the last bits where it's just uh, showing a few extra things now. Um, now I've gone through those kind of main topics. Just other examples of where the browser is actually expanding its capabilities. Firstly, now you can go beyond the usual clunky checkout forms that you might see online a lot. Uh, as a user, you probably understand the frustration of often having to retype out your contact details again, your credit card details again, each time you go to a new site and you want to pay for something. So what if your browser could remember that securely and have you uh, verify that you want to share that with the website, perhaps protected by your fingerprint via a standard native UI. And you can do that with the payment request API, uh, which is available in Chrome and Samsung Internet again. And all you have to do is say new payment request and you pass in some options to configure that with kind of the, the kind of payment that you want to take, uh, how much it is, you know, a breakdown of the costs, for example. And then the browser will load up this native UI for it and allow the user to pay for it. And once you get the result of that back in the browser, then you can uh, send that off securely to your server, your payment gateway to process that payment. Another thing that is coming, uh, or actually is, is around in Chrome already, um, the one-off version of this anyway, is about being able to go beyond that usual case of, well, temporary network downtime and have something actually sync in the background. So if you, uh, for example, send a chat message, but you're offline, you might say it's sending, but you won't be able to send until you come back online again. Before with web apps, it would be very difficult. You'd have to be polling uh, to see uh, what was happening or you listening to network events and it would be quite messy. But now you can have that just happen in the background with background sync. Um, so you can register a one-off sync and then you can listen for that event in your service worker and handle that sync event. So that when the user comes back offline, you send that message straight away in the background. There's also another version of this coming uh, called periodic background sync, which is maybe actually what I first imagined when I heard the term background sync, which is more about saying, for example, every morning uh, I, when the network and battery conditions on my phone are right, I actually want to go and fetch the latest news or uh, content from, from this site. And that is a bit earlier, a bit more nascent at the moment. So that's not in any browsers yet, I don't think. But uh, that is potentially coming soon as well, which is another of these things that's been available in, in native app world for a while and now coming to the web too. And another thing which is really cool is regarding service workers, soon you'll be able to hopefully go beyond the usual single origin caching by using foreign fetch service workers. So the idea of this is that normally uh, your web app can uh, have its own service worker and uh, requests that are made from that web app, you can cache. But what if, for example, you were in control of the jQuery CDN, what you would really want to do then is say that any request to my jQuery.js on, on this CDN from any web app, whether they have a service worker or not, uh, actually use a service worker cache and uh, return that from the cache in this person's browser. And so this is the idea of foreign fetch and it, it could actually really help to speed up the web by having some of these common resources that are used across different sites uh, cached and, and uh, served up a lot quicker. So hopefully this is shared about how the browser is going beyond this idea of what a browser really is or the idea of a browser that we're used to. It's not just anymore about actually going and browsing sites and clicking through links and typing out URLs. 
This is actually about building real applications now. And actual browsing usage is, of course, still something that the web has and will cherish and will ensure still works as well. But we're going beyond that too. And I wrote a little post a while ago about whether browser is still the right word because it's a bit like uh, the word phone now, I think. The phone in our pocket, yeah, it does actually act as a telephone still, but it does a lot more than that as well. And that's the same with browsers now. And the last thing I wanted to share is that we can all help to shape this future of the web that I'm excited about. I hope some of you are excited about it too. And a couple of good ways of, to get involved that uh, I'm hoping to do more this year as well is firstly to uh, join in with the Web Incubator Community Group. They've got a discourse discussion forum uh, that's very easy to join and, and, start, uh, and start contributing and, and sharing ideas about what the web can be and new features that are possible. And we also have a page about uh, Chromium contributions where we link to uh, easy bugs to get started with and things like that if you want to contribute into Chromium. And with that all said and done, thank you very much. Sure, Thank you very much, question. Peter. That was a very exciting, very, very interesting talk. I, uh, I'm in favour of uh, web going back to its uh, best again, and uh, let's uh, let's hope then. Let's uh, wait and see. Any? Uh, we're going to carry on with a few questions, and then we're going to carry on with what's left from Peter and the drinks. Uh, but any questions? Anyone? There you go. <laughs> Um, I know you mentioned about Safari, I'm, I'm going to ask it again. So, um, you mentioned that this, the solution people should take is to go progressive and go offline first and then. But are you seeing, during, during back in the day, we used to put this little thing on our websites, um, you're using IE6, you know, please use a modern browser. Yeah. I mean, do you see that happening? more and more in this space or is it happening at all people getting encouraged you to move off, move off safari um so i hope that we won't go back to those days where we have those messages again because i don't think those are good for our users um i haven't been seeing that coming through again except for demos of course where it's like try this new feature out in this particular browser but i think people doing real app, apps know that that's going to be a bad idea i did forget to mention that Safari do have this uh, under consideration and uh, it has been mentioned in vaguely in kind of five-year plan and things like that there was a while back uh, but time and timings are unknown and, and of course we don't we don't know what they're going to do but I think these technologies are, can be very useful and successful even if Safari was not for the foreseeable future going to add support because they can still be useful to all of those people. There still can be millions of, of users that, that can have access to this um, without Safari. And the more that these other browsers benefit from it and have better experiences for users, then uh, the more reason that is for Apple to introduce support in Safari. So hoping that's gonna be the way that it goes, putting it in a more positive way. <laughs> More questions? Thank you. A great talk. Um, obviously, the fact the web browser allows to interact so many uh, outside devices, as well as having loads of service workers running in the background. What are the security implications of visiting a few websites who start to spend 500 service workers on your laptop, your iPhone, or whatever, or not your iPhone, your Android phone, and slowing everything down? So what are the security implications for all of this? Yeah. Uh, good questions. I guess there's a couple of parts to that because there's security and there's also the performance side, I suppose. So I, just first, I suppose, in terms of service workers and spinning those up, um, it's worth knowing that the browser uh, can, if your site's not up in the tab, that service worker won't necessarily be actually running in the background. It can be stopped by the browser and it can get woken up again if a push notification comes through. Um, so hopefully they shouldn't be taking up too, too many resources. Um, I guess in terms of the caching and things like that, it's, 
it's a bit of an extension of what we have already because you know websites web apps can already have offline databases and things like that um and there actually is i'm not sure of the latest state of it but there is uh a an api to request a permanent cache which i guess is a different thing which is user having to accept yeah i want this like installed as though it's an app that is not going to be deleted unless i specifically delete it but otherwise it's uh like browser caching in general where um if the browser is running out of space then it could, could potentially clear it so um so hopefully that will mean that we won't be clogging up people's devices too much security is a really important area of course and especially with things like web bluetooth you could imagine um for example the case where uh, um, some malicious site starts trying to access devices around people and things like that um so first of all obviously you have to physically pair and decide to pair it with that device um it all of these features, all of them, pretty much all of these features that I shared today are HTTPS only as well, which mitigates from that, those man in the middle attacks. Um, so yeah, it's very important that these are, these are only served in a secure way. And there are other APIs coming through as well, like Web USB, which I didn't mention, which um, is potentially even more of a, whoa, what about the security of that? The browsers are definitely thinking about those security implications and have been sharing some of those thoughts so for example with web usb it's the i believe it's the case that it would you could only actually request to pair with a, a device that's been whitelisted for uh that's actually been whitelisted by that sorry a device that gets shipped a usb device has a set of whitelisted domains that are possible to actually interact with it, even before you actually have the browser request to come up. Um, so yeah, and there's, there's been quite a bit more shared about that in kind of blog posts and things like that, that, that I'd happily um, pass on some more details on afterwards if you like. Um, I guess the summary is, hopefully we think, we think thinking about this. <laughs> And uh, if, yeah, as a community, hopefully we'll, we'll address all the security issues. Can I just quickly add something to mm. that? It's, uh, it's, to me, it's uh, kind of a very similar to what you could expect from a malicious app, native application as well. They, they've got access to all that, all that uh, on the device, even a lot more than the web browser. Uh, it is true that uh, the, the access to a progressive web app or, or to, to a, a web app which will have access to those features might be a little bit easier. There's no such barrier of you installing it, just accessing a URL. But uh, I think it's, we all hope of good in people and uh, uh, yeah, staying away from that. Any more questions? Yep, yeah, one in the back. Hi. Um, is there any plans for like voice integration into browsers so that you could have a website with, say, a Katana or a um, Siri sort of service? Cool. That's a that's a good question. Um, so I know there have at least been discussions about that. Uh, there's been some voice integrations for a while. I'm just trying to remember. That I know that uh, Chrome. A while back had uh, a voice API that uh, was for I think it was translating speech into text um, but not for actually having more as you're suggesting like an actual voice assistant in the in the browser is that kind of what you're asking yeah. about yeah well that is a very interesting area um, in terms of what we're looking at that's definitely kind of watch this space because it's an interesting area, but that's it's a little bit early days, I guess. Um, I think there will be other voice related APIs potentially um, that I'm some of them I'm not sure of the latest details of them, like the, and that Chrome one, um, but some of those may start to piece together to fulfill some of this. Uh, but yeah, I think that's one that still needs to be worked on.
Yeah. Ready? <laughs> Good try. Okay. And related to what he asked, uh, it's more a broad question, but uh, now it seems uh, web apps are catching up with what you can do with native apps. Uh, uh, how do you imagine the future for native apps? Can you see them in the future or are they going to disappear? Um, so I definitely don't want to be kind of standing here saying web's going to win and take over all native apps. And it's like, because there's a lot of those sort of binary discussions and versus this and that kind of, uh, and I think generally it's all quite a bit more nuanced than that. And I think generally it's not quite as zero sum as people think. And there are still some situations where it makes sense, of course, to have native app. There's situations where it makes sense to have a web app. I would like to think that the web can grow more and more into covering more and more of those use cases. So more and more of what you would want to do, if it's nothing um, particularly um, you know, hardware related, it's not particularly single platform related, uh, if the web can achieve that, then that's that's the, that's great, and that's where the web should be aiming to be. Um, I think that native apps will. Well, I can't see them going away any time uh, soon at all. Especially when things like you can imagine high-end gaming and things like that, where they really want to push every ounce of what's available. And in the web world, we want to eventually be getting to that kind of level as well but I think it's going to be a, a much longer term a much longer term process uh, so yeah I think they can still coexist I think actually what we're finding is that they're merging more um, this is something that I'm hoping to write a blog post on soon where it's a little bit I I don't want to uh, be sounding as though uh, I'm sort of uh, saying something that's against the purity of the web or anything but Really, yeah, with some of the things we're seeing through, uh, seeing come through, are actually merging native and web more and more. Um, so, for example, I don't know if any of you've seen um, Chrome's announcement about um, a future version of this adding to home screen for web apps will actually create an actual Android app wrapper for it. So then that will appear in the actual app list. It will appear as an app amongst all the other apps. And it will mean that then, for example, if you get a push notification for that web app, you tap that and it'll take you actually through to the real app that might be running. Um, so that's an example of uh, where these things are merging more and more. And yeah, I think there's also a lot of other examples like that where we'll see some things converging to. Hopefully for the best. It's, it's all about making it the best experience for users really at the end of the day. So. Thank you. I think I'm just going to call it off here and I'm going to invite everyone to socialize. You can still uh, catch up with Peter and uh, um, talk to him about any of uh, what he said. Uh, I'd like to say thank you once again and uh, let's uh, give him once again a round of applause. Thanks very much. Thanks.